Brian Green has been shaking things up on the fair housing front as NAR's Director of Fair Housing and now serving as the Vice President of Policy Advocacy. He's got his finger on the pulse of housing equality, and he's going to talk to us about what our industry has been doing the last year and what we need to continue to do to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a priority across the marketplace. Join us in the conversation and listen up. I want to start to talk about you being like quite the rock star in the NAR world these days. You've oh, thank you. become a pretty popular staff member pretty quickly. So tell me a little bit about your background and how you came to work with NAR. Sure. So I joined NAR last November after 29 years at HUD, um, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So um, it was a brave new world for me. Uh, yeah, that's a big and, change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and at HUD, I was overseeing uh, HUD's Office of Fair Housing. I was the top career person in that office doing that work. And I had done pretty much every job there. And so um, it was a, a, a good time to change. And uh, I, I really did jump right in it. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, really the timing of you jumping in it was pretty extraordinary given what we saw with the Newsday uh, um, reporting and just the, the conversation that I think our industry was beginning to have. Was that exciting to you? Overwhelming in the beginning? It was exciting. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I was still trying to find out, you know, where the water cooler was. So, right. uh, you know, and my job, at least as far as I understood it, was focused on legislative and regulatory advocacy. And this work, um, you know, that we immediately needed to do after that uh, New York Newsday story um, was a lot more introspective, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of um, addressing issues within our industry. So it really opened up a whole other dimension of work, which I suppose was always going to be mine, but <laughs> uh, it laid a great deal of emphasis on it. So yeah. we developed a lot of initiatives that were member directed in addition to you know, responding to Congress and the agencies uh, about these issues and, and all the other issues that you know, affirmatively I had planned to advance. So. It just, yeah, it just opened up several fronts of work for me. Yeah, I mean, definitely the focus feels like it has been more introspectively related to the way that our own members are managing their businesses, you know, their interactions with their clients, of course, the code of ethics changes, all of those being really within market. Is, yeah. is it fair to say that that's still the priority as we head into 2021 or will we see a shift towards that legislative focus again? Uh, well, you know, I wouldn't say that the legislative focus uh, did not become the priority. It really just, uh, you know, the circle expanded, you know. It was a yes and. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, so, uh, in fact, if anything, I think as we, as this year progressed, uh, it became evident that we really needed to talk and engage uh, even more on the federal government front. Um, you know, I, I described a lot of what we did in the early part of the year with ACT, the initiative that we launched uh, to address discrimination within the industry, acronym for accountability, culture change, and training. I, I you know, it, I, I found mid-year I was explaining, look, ACT is about ensuring that our industry is doing what it's already obligated to do under federal laws, state and local laws, uh, licensing laws, as well as our code of ethics. You know, so we should be doing those things already. And you know, Newsday sort of underscored that. Uh, you know, when you do testing, it reveals not everyone's doing what they should be doing. And so those are issues that um, you know are sort of like do no harm, like. You, you, you know, you, you have to satisfy the law. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, <clears throat> um, and especially after the, the killing of George Floyd and more Americans began discussing our neighborhoods and the history of segregation in, in our mm -hmm. communities, um, I think it became really evident that we also need to be vocal on policy 
uh, and how we redress um, how we redress uh, legacy of harm uh, and address structures that you know beyond what individual agents may do um, may perpetuate you know structures that may perpetuate segregation. So. So, you know, they go hand in glove or they're part and parcel. You know, I said, we have act, you know, we need a second act that uh, mm -hmm. follows on and talks about, you know, the um, underpinnings of, uh, you know, the real estate world that may still uh, serve to disadvantage some and uh, advantage others. Um, and so there's a lot more work to do to unpack uh, the issues in our communities. Yeah, so you're a full-fledged Realtor Association staff member now that you've got your own acronym going. So that's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk was about- It actually incidental. It was, I, I, it literally- Oh, it always like is, a... but then we cling to them like, <laughs> like exactly. nobody's business. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about ACT. I want to unpack a little bit of what is already happening and then maybe more of what we can in, uh, in, expect moving into 21 or 2021. So um, talk to me a little bit about the partners that you're bringing into that conversation to work in parallel with NAR. I mean, I think you guys have been really smart in, in sort of assessing what it appears to me is we can't do this by ourselves. There are people who do this work all the time and are really good at it. And they're going to help us rewrite the narrative with our own marketplaces. So talk to me about who some of those people are. Sure. So uh, as I said briefly, ACT um, sort of are three points of a, of a, three points of a triangle, it's like yeah. circle, square, and triangle. A, a sphere, uh, <laughs> if you will. And, uh, and the, you know, it stands for accountability, culture change, and training. And if you think of it as a triangle, you know, you're really kind of uh, closing in on the issue of discrimination from those three vantage points. And each is important. Uh, and you really can't succeed uh, without, um, you know, moving on each, you know, towards the center. And so accountability uh, is all about making sure that at the end of the day, there's some consequence when people engage in discrimination, right? And we as a profession don't want uh, unprofessional people um, out there uh, harming the profession, harming our brokerages, harming our economy, harming our neighborhoods and reputation so much. And so we've said that we want to do self-testing, uh, sort of create mm -hmm. essentially um, a program that companies can tap into so that Newsday doesn't have to do an expose or so the government doesn't have to do testing to reveal what's happening, um, but that companies do it themselves and self-correct. And so that's one area where we are tapping into the expertise that's out there. There are private fair housing groups all throughout this country that have decades of experience doing this kind of work. And so in developing that, we are um, tapping into that network of uh, private fair housing organizations. As, for example, the National Fair Housing Alliance um, is an umbrella group of many of those organizations. So there's an opportunity uh, to um, utilize that network to do testing in different places. Testing is difficult, it's expensive, uh, it's um, intensive. And mm -hmm. so uh, there's a lot of infrastructure there that's already been created. And if we're going to go to say Texas or we're going to go to California or New York, we would want um, to use some of that infrastructure that's there to do this work. So that's underway. Um, so uh, in terms of, um, say, training, we have some new partners. I mean, we discovered the Perception Institute almost as soon as I arrived um, to do implicit bias training with us. And they are uh, premier trainers in this area. Mm -hmm. They do have civil rights background. And I sort of found out about them through other civil rights advocacy groups. Um, one of their co-founders is a, a real estate attorney with uh, civil rights background. And so, so she understood this. She had never worked with um, the realtors uh, and um, they developed uh, in May uh, a 50 minute training video for us as an overview of, of this work. Um, and they're going to do 
more in-depth training with our members um, early next year. Um, and then, you know, there are other groups like the Poverty and Race Research Action Council uh, that's doing preliminary work with us on schools and fair housing. We know mm -hmm. that school segregation and housing segregation reinforce each other. So they've done a lot of work in that space. So we're developing curriculum as well as uh, hopefully a video that talks some about these issues. The Fair Housing Justice Center in New York is working with us on a video about fair housing leaders. They've produced some uh, wonderful videos on fair housing in the past uh, using a great filmmaker named Bill Cavanaugh. Um, they worked with Norman Lear. I remember Norman Lear, the uh, famous producer of uh, shows like All in the Family and <laughs> Good Times and things. Um, so they've done all these great films on housing discrimination in the past. And so they're working with us to do a film on leaders of fair housing in our industry. Um, I think coming out of Newsday, one of the messages we want to send to people is there are real estate agents working in communities who are prosperous um, and follow the law. And <laughs> while we don't know exactly why people in 2020 still are engaged in discrimination, um, there's an opportunity to have peers illustrate that whatever is motivating you, it's unnecessary, you know, it doesn't pay. Uh, in fact, what pays more is working with everybody and look at me, look at what I'm doing and, uh, you know, just have more peers in our industry in, in, in 2020 showing folks this is, this is the way to go. So yeah. that film we hope to uh, release early in the year as well. Yeah. So lots of different partners. Uh, every few uh, weeks, it seems like we're partnering with someone on, on another initiative, all very substantive and ultimately of benefit to our members. I find that exciting though, because I think when I think about the Realtor Advocacy Program, we are so successful in so much of what we do that we tend to row our own boat and, and sort of pave the way for others on a lot of legislative activity and political activity. But in this realm of advocacy, we have not always been the best. We are not necessarily leaders on this front yet. And so I find it exciting to see us finding opportunity to pave our way with some new partners, with new voices, you know, really finding like new breath in this, in this arena. Um, and I appreciate you for helping do that because I think it's important for us. Thanks. It's good for us to not always be just on top. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's healthy. Right. Um, I want to talk about advocacy a little bit uh, and specifically legislative solutions that address fair housing. You know, um, certainly I think we've all uh, started to have a greater understanding of the land use patterns of the past just really systemically re reiterating racist behaviors time after time after time. Um, Austin's a great example of that. Our land use maps were are really based on 1928 red line maps and they don't look that different than they did then, which is um, surely a problem and, and certainly perpetuating segregation in a way that's not healthy for our community. Um, and, and, you know, the solutions to that are, are typically doubling down on land use provisions that control the development or manage where it goes or how it goes. But that's not always conducive to what the market needs either. That's not always healthy for the real estate market. How are you going to help us sort of walk the line between those? Both managing opportunity for greater integration and equality, but also allowing the market to drive the way that it needs to, to to maintain its stability. Yeah, well, you know, I think there's sort of a confluence of those issues right now. Um, if anything, in the real estate world, uh, and you know, I would say this is true, or a sentiment shared by many of our partners in the mortgage banking world as well and home building world. It's that uh, we are short on housing supply yeah. and that um, there are lots of regulatory barriers which um, either limit um, how much you can build, where you can build, or the cost of building. And so I think we're all united in recognizing we need to increase our housing stock and we need to increase uh, the housing stock that's available to first time home buyers and other owner occupants. So I think federal policy and state and local policy sort of join together in trying to find ways to uh, drive that. Um, 
the current administration, you know, which is uh, around for another month, um, had prioritized uh, reduction of regulatory barriers. And there was a great bipartisan effort um, to work together to identify um, the range of regulatory barriers that could be addressed and you know, maintain the other um, you know, public policy purposes for regulation. I mean, you don't wanna get rid of environmental regulation or you know, other regulation that uh, you know, um, ensure safety and other community interests. But <clears throat> um, it was designed to take a look at what could be modified um, to help um, produce more housing, including zoning. And my understanding is uh, the administration still intends to get a report out on that. But that's also one area where we hope that the Biden administration continues this bipartisan effort to identify ways in which the federal government can incentivize state and local actions that will lessen regulatory barriers for the development of more housing, which you know, in turn would make housing more affordable. Yeah. Um, great leadership at the state and local level. You know, we see communities that are re-examining uh, zoning, for example, and uh, you know, making modest changes. And they can be modest changes that have a, a, a major effect. But um, I do think there's an opportunity for local and federal to come together with the industry um, to produce greater housing stock uh, and balance other interests in the community. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that we absolutely need more housing. That is definitely the headline for Austin, Texas, um, given the growth that we continue to enjoy. But it's it's how do you increase capacity while also in parallel e increasing an equitable access to that housing? And I think balancing those interests becomes um, very dynamic, very difficult yeah, on the ground. True. Well, right. And, and, and some of it, I also think, is going to be market driven in that some of these communities that have kept out, say, any kind of multifamily housing, duplexes yeah. even, are discovering yeah. they can't keep doing that. Yeah, you know? yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. If, if you're only building single family all day long, you're only building for certain people. Yeah. <laughs> which and you is know, you, you, had, you had Secretary Ben Carson at HUD saying, you know, these communities need to change. So yeah. I, I think there's a broad spectrum of people saying, you know, we can't live this way in America anymore. Uh, you yeah. know, we're not going to revolutionize it, but uh, we definitely can make marginal changes that have great effects. And that, sure. and, and that will promote, I think, more opportunity in many communities. Yeah. So from an advocacy perspective, I mean, you hit the nail on the head in terms of we were going one way with one administration. We're hoping that we're running that direction with the next. What is that transition like for you? You're now experiencing it not as a HUD official, but on, uh, from a sort of lobbying perspective. What are you excited about? What are you nervous about? Um, you know, I, I'm I'm definitely more excited than nervous. Uh I, I think what makes me nervous is what makes everyone nervous, which is this winter and what COVID is going to do sure. to the country. Uh, but I see lots of hope on the horizon. Uh, you know, obviously the vaccine, which is now uh, delivered to all the states and which will soon be delivered to, uh, you know, the wider population after we take care of uh, the most vulnerable. Uh, so I, I feel hopeful there. Uh, I feel hopeful by everything that President-elect Biden is saying in terms of how he intends to manage that. Um, I feel that our priorities as NAR are in sync with a lot of the things that the Biden administration uh, is looking at. You know, we're about home ownership. Um, we're talking about home ownership uh, as home ownership for everyone, that the American dream has to be equitable and the Biden administration is uh, speaking that same language. You know, they are talking about uh, coordinating equity issues among multiple agencies. Um, I think there's a recognition there that housing policy and transportation policy, environmental policy, um, education policy all go together. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's an opportunity for us to, you know, come up with more cohesive approaches to address those things. To recognize that, you know, you know, for us, for example, student loan debt is a great concern uh, as we uh, want to see the next generation, um, 
you know, gain home ownership opportunities. So I think they recognize that um, GSE reform um, and making sure that we have a strong regulator of Fannie and Freddie and that mm -hmm. those um, entities further the um, mission um, that they have to provide a liquidity for low and moderate income um, home mortgages. So I, I think, you know, um, we, we see uh, very common interests there. Uh, so I, I'm hopeful. I mean, obviously the devil's going to be in the details of all these things, but, uh, you know, we've had engagements already with uh, the incoming administration and, and it all seems very positive. Yeah. I mean, lots of work to be done, if nothing else, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the work that keeps us busy is good work. I want to, um, in, in thinking about the ACT acronym and accountability, you spoke about an, um, the example of, of the testing programs that NAR is rolling out, but um, there was also sort of a poignant moment for NAR this year in terms of accountability when 2021 President Charlie Opler apologized on behalf of the organization for the policies that we've supported, um, like, you know, redlining land use patterns in the past that have led to systemic racism. Um, tell me why you think it's important that leadership like Charlie take that approach and talk to me about if you think that we will see more of that and, and how that reconciliation sort of happens from here. Sure. You know, I, I just think that when we talk about uh, our history and when we talk about our successes, um, we have to own everything. And yeah. so I think we can only understand the present day if we speak candidly uh, about how we got here. And so um, I think the work that NAR has been doing that led to Charlie Oppler's apology, um, you know, was sort of in the making for a, a long time. Uh, you know, most notably in 2018, the association on the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act uh, acknowledged this history uh, and, you know, how NAR had opposed the passage of the Fair Housing Act, um, but more fundamentally that the communities that we see and the segregation that we see in America still today isn't the result of just one group uh, or, you know, people of color uh, yeah. failing to earn more or failing to get ahead. You know, this was all design and mm -hmm. uh, that housing policy and the exclusion from neighborhoods, exclusion of mortgages and, you know, all these other practices uh, made it impossible for people of color to gain wealth and to pass on wealth uh, and, you know, to even move to the suburbs and, you know, and, and conversely, we, we, we created policies that provided a lot of stuff for free <laughs> for a lot of the public and, you yeah. know, subsidized um, a large um, portion of this country, um, you know, for decades, you know, the white population. And so, mm -hmm. um, so when we, recognize today that in order for our economy to, to hum, in order for us to, you know, get, get ahead, we need to make sure that everyone's moving ahead and that, you know, the growth uh, in this country is going to come largely from, you know, people of color in the housing industry. The, mm -hmm. the, the home ownership rate among whites um, is, is relatively high and, you know, probably will max out at some point. We're not going to have 100% home ownership. So, you know, maybe we'll have 75, 80% home ownership if we're fortunate. But uh, that uh, it, once we tap out there, uh, we need to make sure that the Hispanic home ownership rate and the African American home ownership rate, uh, you know, in the 40s needs to climb. Asian home ownership rate in the 60s needs to climb. Uh, and that's where we're going to see the boosts in our economy. Uh, and that's where we have seen, I mean, Hispanic millennials have, you know, for the last decade been driving the housing growth. So um, all of this is a recognition that, you know, we're, where we are for a reason. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and you know, this was policy and yeah. that we need to be thoughtful as we go ahead and yeah. uh, recognize the past. And it's only if you recognize that, that you can fashion, you know, the policies for the future. So yeah. I think, it, I think it was really, really critical and uh, sometimes hard for, for all members to understand. Overwhelmingly people do, but, you know, 
we, we do find that there, there are many members who still see discrimination as sort of one-off things that some bad folks did and that, you know, the membership shouldn't be talking about, about that history. It, it would be convenient to be able to continue to avoid it, but unfortunately that won't serve us well. And I think that NAR is doing a good job of, of leading forward that that reconciliation is necessary, that it is um, potent, and then it will certainly lead the way for a bright future for housing. It's not, you know, it's not without benefit to everyone that we recognize what has gone wrong and what we have to do better. So I yeah. think you guys are doing a good job on that front. Good, um, Yeah, you bet. Happy to give the props where they're due. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about what agents and brokers individually can and should be doing. So it, it can be overwhelming to think about um, how to really address your own bias, how to begin to make changes in your own business. Give them like the low, la the low hanging fruit. What are the things today that people can do to just start to do a little better where they might not be the best? Uh, well, I would say um, folks have to appreciate that they may have biases that enter into the transaction, that as much as we all think we know everything there is to know on fair housing, uh, we may surprise ourselves. And so I think just to have that sort of self-awareness is, is the first point. Uh, second, I think um, as trite as this may sound, we need to make a conscious effort to make sure we're treating everyone fairly, whether that means having a mental checklist of things that we do with everybody. Um, I think, you know, and there's some people who say, oh, you know, people should have a written checklist. That's a little <laughs> awkward sometimes, but, but, <laughs> but literally sort of think about, you know, what is your, you know, protocol? What is your approach with everybody? Uh, and just, you know, be conscious of that. I mean, when you look at the New York Newsday video and you see uh, the differences in treatment, um, mm -hmm. you know, many times they do seem intentional, but maybe sometimes they're unintentional where people are just winging it and their biases are coming into play. And so they find themselves, you know, telling uh, white homeowners all about the school districts and which school districts to avoid and which, you know, the good ones, et cetera. And then you know, when they're dealing with a person of color, they're not having that conversation or they're conversely like praising a school district that they just maligned. Um, and so, you know, if you're doing that unintentionally, if you're conscious of, you know, what your, uh, you know, approach is with each person, you can correct some of that. You know, we just launched um, a simulation called Fair Haven. The Fair Haven. Yeah. Talk to us about it. And that I think for many people is a good reminder of just how tricky fair housing can be. So Fair Haven is an online uh, interactive simulation. Uh, the folks who developed it at Ernst & Young, um, their learning labs have done a lot of projects like this. They actually call it gaming and yep. um, we would call it gaming too, but some people thought that was not serious enough, you know, when talking about this, the subject of housing. Gaming's just the tactic. The, the, yeah. the, this yeah. is not a game, but gaming yes, is the exactly. tactic. But right, right, the platform is like a game and, you know, you're right. presented with these scenarios and you actually have a challenge to sell four homes in six months and you're confronted with different situations where someone else, you know, in the scenario may be engaged in discrimination or where you may be, you know, tempted to um, engage in discrimination, you know, as you reach towards your goal of closing a deal. And so it really just challenges you with, you know, different paths you can take. Um, and, you know, I think thinking about Led Zeppelin, you know, there, there are two paths uh, you can go on, but in the long run, there's still time to change the path you're on, or maybe there are two roads you can go by. I'm forgetting the exact lyrics, but, but, you know, there are different branches you can take and you actually uh, might prolong the game by taking one uh, road, um, but you learn something along mm. the way. Uh, and you, know, you can ultimately get back on, on path, um, but you might, you know, it, it may slow you down and you get feedback along the way. And so ultimately you're trying to close these four deals and you learn 
uh, about the different ways in which discrimination can occur. And I found that even as we were developing it, I mean, I was, you know, subject matter consultant along with one of my team, but even then I, I found it thought provoking and challenging. And yeah. many of the people who have gone through it have said they expected it to be, you know, schmaltzy and, you know, unrealistic and that they found themselves really tested. And so it's helpful because it, it reminds you that, you know, real estate transactions and real life, although this isn't real life, um, it's messy mm. and different choices may seem, you know, uh, equally attractive, but, you know, you still have to do some discernment. So I think it's been very, very helpful in that way. And at the end of the day, I think when it comes to fair housing, it really is all about testing your muscles. You know, uh, it isn't just about reading a book or, you know, yeah. uh, sitting in a classroom. It's really about testing, you know, testing yourself in real life situations. And it's possible that a lot of people don't have the opportunity, you know, to test themselves in, you know, situations with diverse populations. Um, so this really makes you think, and we've just been gratified at just how much people have appreciated it. Um, I, you know, I don't think I even fully appreciated just how much exposure it would get and how much commentary it would get. Yeah. Um, but we've just been very fortunate. It's been, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Well, realtors will always tell you what they think, but <laughs> for the ones who want to access it, who maybe don't know where it is, is it on the realtor site? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, one very easy place to find it is fairhaven.realtor. Oh, great. Perfect. Yeah. We'll put it in the show notes too. So everybody's got that. Yeah. Yeah. I think those tactical options are a great place to wrap up our serious talk and now run with a rapid fire round if you're up for it. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, who, what, what's your favorite book? My favorite book. Gosh. Do I have a favorite book? I mean, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um let's see in this season this chapter what's your favorite book you mean in this time forever. in my life at this time in your life which one I mean I don't know you could have asked me that five years ago it would have been completely different than today probably <laughs> yeah gosh um I don't know I I, I think a, a book that I I really enjoyed recently was actually, I have it right here. The Splendid and the Vile. By okay. Eric Larson. And he right. is, he is um, he, you know, best-selling author. He's uh, written uh, a lot of other books that I'd probably consider among my, my favorites, um, like um, Beast in the Garden is another, or sorry, In the Garden of Beasts. Um, he, he writes historical, it's historical nonfiction, but it, it's mm -hmm. very, um, you know, creative and you feel like you're there. Mm -hmm. uh, and Splendid in the Vial is, is really about uh, Winston Churchill's leadership um, during World War II, um, during the Blitzkrieg raids. And it's mm -hmm. really sort of focused on that period. And I began reading this um, early during the pandemic. Yeah, I'm like co-pandemic. That feels pretty intense, Brian. Yeah. Well, you know, because it, you know, you know, it, it kind of felt like time we to were, step up your church. Show. We're in a <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> right. It felt like we were we were bunkered and yeah, um, yeah. But and so it was really weird because I was reading it and I was thinking we're going through something like this where we're you know we're you know this period of deprivation. But you know the characters in the book would go out at night and they would go you know to clubs and movies. And I kept thinking, you can't do that, you know, you can't be among people. I'm like, oh, right, right, no, this is, this is World War II, you know, we're going to a different kind of war. It's yeah. a different one. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, okay, so, so everything that he writes, I, I buy. Um, okay, but let's, let's go opposite. That was very academic of you to like that. Now, now tell me your favorite binge-worthy TV. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, I have three kids, so I, I barely watch TV. Uh, I can say during my paternity leave, uh, I finally, I caught up on Mad Men one time. Remember that? Too? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but with twins, you caught up on Mad Men during paternity leave. I, I think that was during my first 
Oh, okay. I was going to say that's that. impressive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then um, binge worthy. Yeah. You know, I, it's mostly one offs because I never know when I'm going to get back to it. I mean, there, there are old things that, that I've watched like Inspector Morse. I think during my second uh, paternity leave, I watched that. That's an old BBC program. Um, it was on Netflix for a while and these things disappear from Netflix. <laughs> it's yeah. spoken like a true parent to mark your binge watching according to when the children were born i can oh, right. attest yeah. to the same <laughs> and i i didn't have to Post and i didn't have to right i didn't have to work the next day uh, yeah but most most evenings i'm, I'm just way too tired um okay. and then there's something now on that i'm trying to binge but i end up uh watching in, in small bites uh it's called small acts i don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard this it's by a fellow named Steve McQueen, not the American actor, but a British <laughs> filmmaker. He actually uh, did the movie um, uh, 12 Years a Slave some years uh, ago. Yeah. Um, this is a collection of five movies he did. Um, and they're, you know, presented as, a, as an anthology. And they just came on Amazon Prime around Thanksgiving. Um, one released every week. And it's about... Um, it's about the life of Afro Brits. Um, mm. So not all that light, <laughs> yeah. um, but it's fiction. We need, get, we need to get you out a little bit, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> this, this lightning round is going to be concerned for you, yeah. but we're going to yeah. find a way. Yeah. And then the other thing I just watched was the, the Bee Gees documentary. Okay. Now I'm feeling better. <laughs> there you go. That's amazing. That's great. That's I'm, awesome. I'm, I've been, I've been, singing the praises of the Bee Gees <laughs> and their songwriting for years. And so I feel vindicated because people are like the Bee Gees. And I'm like, oh, no, no, they're, uh, you know, Barry yeah. Gibbs songwriting, brilliant. Take brilliant. a listen. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for spending time with me today. I really appreciate it. I know our listeners will benefit from hearing from you and we're just glad to have you on our team. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for having yeah. me.